And good evening, everybody. I'm Erin Haynes, back from Mehdi Hassan. Almost exactly five years ago, just after the stunning election of Donald Trump, Barack Obama took his last trip overseas as president. He traveled to Athens, Greece, the birthplace of democracy. And he gave a speech reaching across the ages, reassuring the world that America would remain a shining city on a hill, a beacon of freedom, and a democracy for all to see. You may have noticed the next American president and I could not be more different. <laughs> we are, we have very different points of view, but American democracy is bigger than any one person. The most important office in any country is not president or prime minister. The most important title is citizen. Power and progress will always come from the Timos, from we the people. And I'm confident that as long as we are true to that system of self-government, that our futures will be bright. But half a decade later, how bright are our futures? And how secure is American democracy? You're looking at newly released footage of Trump supporters breaching the Capitol on January 6th as police tried to close a security door on them. Every day we learn more about how these weren't tourists and this wasn't a simple protest. This was an attack on democracy itself. And the Congressional January 6th Select Committee today issued a new round of subpoenas to pro-Trump groups that were there at the Capitol, including Oath Keepers, Militia, and the Proud Boys. You know, the ones that Donald Trump told from the debate stage to stand back and stand by. An attack on democracy. And it's still going on. Republicans across the country are pushing to make voting harder. They've sought to get Trump allies in positions of power in key states so that he won't lose again if he runs in 2024. Something that's looking increasingly likely as Trump's own pollsters show Joe Biden's numbers sinking in some swing states and as the Republican Party picks up the tab for some of Trump's personal legal expenses while he faces possible prosecution in New York. And it's all happening as white wing media tells its viewers that liberals want to cancel them, replace their votes, brainwash their kids, and destroy everything America stands for. The latest alarm bell is an NGO report that lists the United States for the first time ever as a backsliding democracy. That report, by the Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, or IDEA, says, quote, the United States, the bastion of global democracy, fell victim to authoritarian tendencies itself and was knocked down a significant number of steps on the democratic scale. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a second. The worst news is that we have lots of company. IDEA says that more countries than ever are in democratic backslides, including other world powers like Brazil and India a trend that started even before Trump became president, and that IDEA says got worse after Trump tried to negate last year's election. Look, I want to be with Barack Obama on this one. America has never been perfect, but it has evolved since, for the better since its founding. We've been able for so long to point to progress in making this country fairer and free for more people. But you don't need another report to tell you that's not the direction we're headed in now. We've been saying this is not normal for long enough. Perhaps this is the new normal. Is this who we are? Is American democracy doomed? Or can the lessons of American history still inspire our citizenry to fight for a more perfect union? Joining me now are Ruth ben Giet, professor of history and Italian studies at NYU and author of the book Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present and publisher of Lucid, a newsletter on threats to democracy. Also here is Jelani Cobb, a staff writer at The New Yorker, journalism professor at Columbia University, and MSNBC political contributor. Ruth, I want to come to you. In the early 1920s, Mussolini got the Italian parliament to pass the Acerbo Law, which gave the winning party two-thirds of the seats in parliament, even if they only got 25% of the vote. Mm -hmm. The following year, 1924, mm -hmm. Mussolini fascists won that majority and never gave it up until they lost World War II. So, I mean, 100 years later, how precarious is American democracy? And how does this moment mm -hmm. compare to the rise of fascism? It's, well, it was my training in, in Italian fascism that allowed me to diagnose 
Trump as an authoritarian in 2016 and to forecast uh, that he would use an authoritarian playbook to, to govern. And Trump had no interest in governing like any president before him, Republican or Democratic. He wanted to gain and keep absolute power. He wanted to use public office to, um, for private gain. And so his goals had nothing to do with governance or public welfare. And you see what he's been able to do uh, chiefly in making the GOP his personal tool and imposing truly an authoritarian style party discipline so that even uh, luminaries in his own party, if they voted against him for impeachment, they had to buy body armor uh, like Representative Peter Meyer. So this is someone who has brought America uh, into uh, an authoritarian political culture with all the consequences we see. Well, Jelani, I want to come to you and let's get in the way back machine. I remember you writing a book, The Substance of Hope, about Barack Obama and his kind of optimistic vision for this country. You heard uh, the former president's words from 2016 at the beginning of this segment. I think we definitely realized we were not post-racial after Barack Obama, but, but are we post-democratic now? And, and how much of the anti-democracy trend goes back to the pervasive fear of a black president? I mean, as Ruth talked about, the authoritarian trend in the GOP goes back a lot farther. But where would we be without, uh, you know, the backlash to, to Barack Obama? Would we be where, where, where we are without that? So, I mean, I think there's a lot to be said there. You know, one is the fact that there have been authoritarian t tendencies in American de democracy for a very long time. You know, they've managed to coincide or coexist uh, with American democracy. Uh, but it had always been that strand uh, of, of rhetoric and political activity in the United States. Uh, and people thought of it as a kind of marginal idea. But one of the most important things is we're talking about being post-racial, being post-democratic. You know, race has consistently been the Achilles heel of American democracy. Yes. Uh, you know, it's like W.E.B. Du Bois said, either the United States will destroy ignorance or ignorance will destroy the United, the United States. And he was speaking specifically in the, the racial cast of this. Uh, and so if we go back to the 1930s, we find, you know, kind of awkward moments where, you know, Hitler praised the United States uh, and saying that the other European powers didn't get the importance of racial purity, but the United States <laughs> did. Uh, or we could go to the 1960s when Lincoln Rockwell and the American Nazi Party uh, were protesting Martin Luther King uh, and uh, attacking Martin Luther King. Uh, and there were people who didn't know, and this is just 20 years after World, the end of World War II, didn't know whether they were more offended by Martin Luther <laughs> King's marches for integration or by the existence of the American Nazi Party. Uh, and yeah. so there has been that strand. Uh, you know, in American life, and you know, the the German American Bund and uh, the rallies uh, in in uh, Madison Square Garden. We can kind of go on and on and on. Uh, but the fact of it is, until we are able to grapple with what the implications of Obama's election were, we won't have any sort of hope of, of successfully navigating the moment that we're in right now. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what the rest of the world is is, is observing, uh, as that report points out. And Ruth, the, look, the crazy thing is some of the most anti-small D Democratic Trump people are actually pointing the finger at capital D Democrats. Let's just listen to what Michael Flynn had to say the other day. I am not convinced that we are going to have national elections in 2022. And the reason why I believe that is because the, the, the left does not want to risk losing to the conservative movement that has clearly grown in the country. Democrats who took their licks in 2010, 2012, 2014, and 2016 are now going to suspend elections next year. This is a week after Flynn said America needs, quote, one religion for everyone. I mean, what planet are these people living on here and what are they angling at? So the whole speech that, that was part of a speech that uh, Flynn gave which is pure projection. And he says that not only uh, the Democrats are gonna suspend elections, but they're gonna have an engineered collapse of the American economy. And this is actually a right-wing playbook, which uh, Flynn and Bannon know very well. It was used in the 1970s by the CIA in Chile. I write about it extensively in Strongmen. And I've thought for a very long time that this is the kind of playbook that they're trying to bring to America where you, you, it all the storylines come together, Biden as a socialist, Biden as an authoritarian, 
Uh, and back then in the 70s, the CIA manipulated the supply chain and created scarcity fears. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, because of the pandemic, it's not Biden's fault, but it's being manipulated by the right wing press here. So all of this is coming toward uh, what you have to do if you want to uh, just, you have to get the public on board for whatever kind of anti-authoritarian action you have planned. And so that's exactly what the Republicans have been doing for some time. And they've also been trying, like all the authoritarians since Mussolini, to change uh, people's perception of violence, to lead people to think that violence is justified and even morally righteous and patriotic. So it's a very dangerous moment. Well, well, Jelani, I asked you about Obama. Let me now also ask you about Joe Biden, because when you listen to what he says, President Biden seems to get the stakes. Listen to this. This is a time of testing. We face an attack on our democracy and on truth. The struggle is far from over. The question of whether our democracy will long endure is both ancient and urgent. We have to ask. Are you on the side of truth or lies, fact or fiction, justice or injustice, democracy or autocracy? That's what it's coming down to. Nothing about our democracy is assured, as I'm sure you're all become to realize. Nothing about our freedom is guaranteed. We have to work for it. Okay, Jelani, so he sounds like he gets it here. But here we are with no voting rights reform. He's not even pushing to get rid of the Senate filibuster that lets 40 Republican senators block his entire agenda. And this is the guy that Republicans say stole the election is gonna, and is going to suspend democracy? Are Democrats really equal to this moment? I mean, that's a serious question. Uh, I mean, it goes back to the same thing that you know, Barack Obama said in that Athens speech, uh, where it is seeming to be a strategic underestimation of just uh, how uh, volatile and dangerous the forces we encounter are, uh, because they certainly justify uh, actions that would shore up democracy uh, in the face of what they're attempting to do uh, beyond just the, the reality uh, that what we're seeing, you know, voter suppression uh, was the mechanism by which American democracy was previously curtailed. We did not have a democracy in this country prior to 1965. Uh, and so it, the example of history is there, it's blatant. Uh, but the actions don't seem to be matching the words right now. Yeah. Well, Ruth ben Giat and Jelani Cobb, thank you so much for excellent context, time, the past, to the present. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Enjoy your holiday. When we return, COVID cases are on the rise again in some parts of the country. In Michigan, cases are up 46 percent in the past two weeks, and already some hospitals are in a state of crisis. But now, some state's National Guards are picking fights with the Pentagon? We'll talk about that in 60 seconds, here on The Choice from MSNBC. Since the start of this pandemic, the fight against the virus has been framed as a war against COVID-19. And throughout this war, our military has played a central role, often in helping us fight it, and at other times, it's been more complicated. Remember what happened in Guam? Okay, I know it's been a long year, so let me just quickly refresh your memory. It was back in March 2020, as the U.S. was just beginning to go into lockdowns, that COVID quickly began spreading on the USS Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier. More than 100 personnel were infected in less than 10 days. Captain Brett Crozier fired off a scathing letter, urging the ship be evacuated because of the outbreak. After his letter was leaked, Acting Secretary of the Navy, Thomas Modley, fired Crozier. Then the secretary was forced to resign the next month. And then there were the U.S. Navy ships, Mercy and Comfort, each deployed to Los Angeles and New York City in the depth of the pandemic to help treat COVID patients. By the time vaccines were being rolled out to the public, our military was front and center in the mass vaccination effort. President Biden, our commander in chief, even called getting the vaccine patriotic. His administration announced hundreds of vaccination sites in 43 states and territories that the National Guard would be managing with more than 1,000 Guard members. For many Americans, when the military gets behind a cause, they feel like they should support it too. And so it mattered that then General John Evans spoke about the need for people in the military to get vaccinated early this year. 
humans are social animals, right? But in the military, we tend to find ourselves together quite a bit, whether that's in training, in the garrison environment, and certainly for our deployed soldiers that are in combat, could find themselves in very close confines. So we're working each and every day to protect ourselves. Today, it seems like that message hasn't resonated with everyone in the military. In August, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced a COVID vaccine mandate for all service members, and there's been some pushback in the ranks. Now, to be clear, mandates have gone a long way. The Navy has the highest vaccination rate, with more than 96% of active duty personnel fully vaccinated. The Air Force is close behind, and then the Army. And the Marines are last at 91%. Now, in raw numbers, that means that up to 10,000 active duty Marines will not be fully vaccinated by their November 28th deadline. And it's a big deal coming from a branch of the military that's built upon following orders and is billed as the world's finest fighting force. A retired Marine Corps officer told the Washington Post that leadership should be alarmed that the Marine Corps ethos appears to be tarnished in this case. Why, he asked, did they decide not to follow a direct order? But it's not only the Marines. Thousands of Air Force personnel have also refused the vaccine. More than a dozen U.S. service members have filed a lawsuit trying to overturn the DOD's vaccine mandate. And in Oklahoma, there's a revolt underway. Republican Governor Kevin Stitt asked the National Guard's Brigadier General Thomas Mancino to issue a memo exempting Oklahoma's troops from the Pentagon vaccine mandate. Governor Stitt also wrote a letter to Secretary Austin asking him to suspend the mandate, saying that it was about personal freedoms and asking service members to potentially sacrifice their personal beliefs. And is catching on. Other Republican governors are considering following Oklahoma's lead, including Texas and Alaska. So, should the Pentagon's vaccine mandate cover state National Guard troops? And what does it say about the state of America today if service members are refusing national orders? Joining me now is U.S. Navy veteran Tom Porter. He's the executive vice president of government affairs at IAVA, Iraq and Afghan Veterans of America. He's also a captain in the U.S. Navy Reserve with service since 1996. So let me start by asking, what do you make of what's happening with Oklahoma's National Guard under Governor Kevin Stitt? I mean, Texas and Alaska look like they're pushing back against this federal vaccine mandate for members of the military. How big of a deal is this? Uh, thank you for, uh, for having me on tonight. It's, it's great to be with you. Um, let me just start by saying that IAVA has, has been very active in the, our communities with other veterans organizations and encouraging all Americans, including active duty military, uh, to get vaccinated as soon as possible. But these uh, latest developments are very troubling. Um, as you've seen, as you cited, that, that the uh, vaccination rate for the various services are in the 90s. And while most Americans think that that might mean, um, that that might be a good thing, but but I'll tell you that it's not like, like, not like a math grade in eighth grade. Um, when you have 90, 92, 91, 96% amongst the services vaccinated, that means many thousands of service members are not vaccinated. So that's a big deal, it's a big readiness deal. And then when you have the uh, the latest news that you're refer referencing about the National Guard, uh, I know that the DOD is very secure in their position that they have the legal authority to require all service members, including uh, National Guard or reservists to, to have the vaccine. It's a readiness issue. Uh, all service members need to be ready to deploy. Marine Corps uh, prides itself on being uh, able to fight tonight and they can't fight tonight if they've got several thousand of their of their Marines that are unable to go and deploy, just like you saw uh, weeks ago uh, when our service members uh, flew in at short notice into Kabul to rescue uh, hundreds of thousands, 100,000 uh, Americans, service members, and Afghan allies. Such a good point that you're making about readiness. Uh, on the Marines, again, we're seeing that branch of the military has the lowest vaccination rate, taking into account that more than 90% of Marines have been vaccinated. Uh, as you said, that's thousands of people that are not vaccinated. How should we be reading this? Is this cause for concern or is it normal to have some resistance to an order? It, it is a, con a concern and what, what people like me that have served for a long time, uh, I've, I've been stuck by, a, by a, a needle with all kinds of vaccinations over 25 years, over and over and over again. All the military branches have their own annual requirements to, to get vaccinations flow from flu shots uh, to everything else. Um, and so this is something that is not new to the military. Uh, all military members are used to getting vaccinations as a requirement annually by their services. So what I would encourage 
uh, all service members um, and all Americans, uh, frankly, uh, to not you know, listen to the rumors that they're seeing online and conspiracy theories from their, uh, from their friends. But what they need to do is talk to their doctor, talk to medical experts to find out uh, the answers to their questions and then get, uh, get the uh, vaccination and make sure that you're contributing um, and not lessening the readiness of your service. Uh, your service members that, that you serve to the left and the right of, uh, they need you to do their job. Well, to your point, what do you think the way out of this is? I mean, the Army is saying that they won't promote or re-enlist troops who refuse the COVID vaccine and haven't requested an exemption. I mean, is that fair? Uh, well, the, the, the Army has their own requirements. Some of the services, most of the services are requiring uh, service members to get vaccinated or they're getting uh, separated from the military. I think the Army has their, their own processes, but you'd have to, uh, to ask the Army about that. What service members should know and what I would want them to know is that they've invested a great deal of time in this career in the military. And it means a lot to them. It means a lot to their family. And so I would say that don't throw it away. Uh, this is something that you've earned. Once you keep what you've earned, get get the shot and be healthy and be deployable and and help your teammates be ready to deploy and defend the country. Yeah, a reminder about the stakes and also just about uh, their role and why they you know committed to this in the first place. Well, after the Army announced that, Senator Ted Cruz tweeted, uh, Biden administration persecuting our soldiers. What do you think when you read something like that? Well, it's unfortunate, especially when we have uh, leaders in the Congress um, and throughout America and, and the American political life um, spreading rumors and, um, and making a political point uh, over this vaccination. It's not. This is a, not a partisan issue. This is a health issue, and it's a readiness issue for the military. Well, in a recent interview, Eugene Fidel, the president emeritus of the National Institute of Military Justice, said, people are resisting this for no good reason. This is politics by other means. This is Trumpism manifesting itself in the state guard. Do you agree with that? Well, I would say that in the beginning that, that many people rightfully would have been concerned about a new vaccine, but now it's proven, it's safe, the medical community is behind it, and the military is behind it. And so we're at a different point now where the science is there uh, and it's, it's a safety issue and a readiness issue. And I keep getting back to it is, is if thousands of our military members aren't ready to deploy and defend the country, then we're in a really bad place and we need to get past that. Yeah, and, and to that end, what should President Biden or Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin do, do you think? I mean, how do you get a military to obey a command that's become such a divisive is issue? And what do you do when the fight against COVID has become so politicized? Well, it's unfortunate that it's been politicized, but we have to keep uh, keep moving forward, keep encouraging the service members that uh, haven't gotten vaccinated to do so by the deadline, but much of the deadlines have been passed uh, already for active duty. Um, and some of the reserve and guards have some extended deadlines, but so we still have a chance to, to maximize the compliance with this. Um, it's not a partisan issue and uh, the secretary and the president need to stay the course. And unfortunately, we're gonna lose some, some good service members. I'd, I'd hate to do that, um, but our recruiters have their jobs cut out for them, it looks like. And so we're gonna have to keep moving forward uh, with service members and future service members that are gonna truly commit to the safety and, and health of the military community. Tom Porter, thank you so much for coming on. Have a great holiday. When we return, Jackson, Mississippi has two problems, cash flow and water flow. Well, actually it has more than two problems, but those are the two big ones. The hope is that money from Joe Biden's new infrastructure plan will flow to fix that water problem. But now, even that is a problem. I'll explain in just 60 seconds. On Friday, the city of Jackson, Mississippi, finally lifted its latest boil water advisory, just in time for the annual Soul Bowl. That's the big HBCU rivalry between Jackson State University and Alcorn State University. Jackson State won, by the way, by two touchdowns, 24 to 10. In Jackson, Mississippi, having to boil water or having none at all is nothing new. 
People there have endured water outages for years now. And in February, thousands of them went without clean water for a month. This month, schools were closed because there was nothing for the kids to drink. Fixing the aging water system is expected to cost billions of dollars. That's not easy in a place that is shrinking the way that Jackson is. It's down by about 20,000 people, according to the latest census. And now only 150,000 or so are left in Mississippi's capital city. The president Jackson residents voted for last year made a promise to fix water systems across the country in a bill he recently signed into law. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. It's a once in a generation investment in America. Unlike anything we've seen or done since we built the interstate highway system and the space race decades ago. American Jobs Plan will put plumbers and pipe fitters to work, replacing 100% of the nation's lead pipes and service lines. So every American, every child, can turn on a faucet of our fountain and drink clean water. Getting federal help would make all the difference for the people who live in Jackson. But here's the thing. The president doesn't get to decide how that money gets allocated at the local level. That is up to the Mississippi legislature. And while Jackson is more than 80% black, the legislature is run by a majority white Republican legislature. It's not at all clear how willing the Republican government of Mississippi will be able to help the capital city where they convene. For more, joining us now is Jackson, Mississippi Mayor Shokwe Lumumba. Mayor Lumumba, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Aaron. So how much money do you estimate that it's going to take to replace Jackson's crumbling water pipes? And, and what's the best case scenario of what Jackson can expect out of the BIF if the Republican legislature deems it to be so? Well, let, let me say this, uh, that our infrastructure challenges have been well documented. And, you know, we've repeated the refrain that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when the system will fail again. Uh, because they are aged, uh, they are not. It is not a sustainable infrastructure. Uh, we estimate that that just dealing with the water woes alone, uh, we're probably in about a six hundred million dollar uh, realm of, of need. Uh, what I have spoken about previously is the comprehensive infrastructure challenges that Jackson has. Uh, not only do we have drinking water challenges, but we also have well documented wastewater challenges, and, and we are presently in a consent decree uh, with the EPA. Uh, and so we hope, uh, we are prayerful, and, and I would express cautious optimism that the state of Mississippi uh, truly understands the challenge and that these aren't Democratic or Republican water lines. Uh, this is a human need that we have to account for. Yeah. Well, hope and optimism, it is it is the season for hope and optimism. Uh, I was reading about how some of Jackson school kids are losing up to an hour a day of learning time because they have to go outside to use portable toilets. Uh, rebalancing equity is supposed to be a big part of the infrastructure law, supposed to be a big part of this administration in terms of priorities. But it's not just the utilities, is it? I mean, it all kind of cascades into every aspect of life, including things as fundamental as education. When you overlay disparities in education, when you overlay... Um, when you overlay issues of, of environmental equity, uh, you, you often find the same communities that are affected. Uh, as I speak to our residents about our challenges with our water infrastructure, uh, no, we don't have a lever that provides water to North Jackson versus uh, South Jackson, uh, but you know, city planning is never neutral. Uh, and so as, as property evaluations were made years and years ago, uh, those, those communities that were closer to the resources closer to the water treatment plants uh, that did not have to travel to the farther ends of the city and up higher elevations, uh, those property values uh, ultimately uh, have ultimately been uh, less valuable than, than other communities. And so we have to make certain that not only we build a sustainable infrastructure, but we build an equitable one, one that, that one portion of the community isn't disproportionately uh, represented and, and affected. Yeah, I mean, I know that's that's the whole reason that you, you ran to become mayor of, of Mississippi's capital city. But I mean, kids who don't have indoor bathrooms at school and may not have clean water at home, uh, that, that's just a humiliating way to live, isn't it? This is also a dignity issue. What, what are your constituents telling you? Well, it's a cycle of humiliation. That's how we refer to it. Uh, my constituents are, are, are you know, exhausted uh, with this challenge, as you might imagine. 
Uh, and, and it is heartbreaking, not only for me, but it's heartbreaking when you see children who, when we go to speak to them, uh, they just talk about wanting to have a, a sound learning environment uh, and not to be displaced from their schools on occasion, having to be sent to other schools across the city uh, in order to, to maintain uh, the opportunity to, to have class. Uh, and so, you know, we think that these are actually the metrics by which success should be dictated. When we look at the state budget, when we look at the federal budget, it should be less about uh, where the stock market is, whether we're able to build new edifice within our city, and what are the sustainable development goals? What is the quality of our infrastructure? What is the quality of our education? Whether our children have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, those are the sustainable development goals that we think better represent a successful economy. We coin it as our aim for a dignity economy. Yeah, well, as a fellow Southerner, I am more than familiar with the uh, reality that racial politics and partisan politics are often one and the same. How do racial politics really affect the way that Republicans deal with the city of Jackson? Well, I, I express cautious optimism, but uh, I would be less than prudent if I didn't look at the history of, you know, what is allocated to Jackson. I uh, didn't look at the history, recent history, uh, in negotiations as, as the world turned its eye to Jackson and, and the recent February storms, or, or last, uh, the, the storms we had this, this past February, and how it debilitated our water system. As the world was tuning in, and we were saying that we had $47 million worth of immediate needs that had to be addressed, ultimately we received $3 million, uh, and not even uh, dedicated to the, the water treatment facility that was in the greatest need. Uh, you know, this has been a common uh, discussion amongst uh, ourselves and the leadership of the state house. Uh, sometimes we have been turned away uh, as discussions turn to, you know, how we leverage away resources or investments that the city has made, such as in our airport. Uh, I don't believe that those those discussions should be one and the same. Uh, we should be able to have conversations about how we support infrastructure for uh, the residents of our city uh, without having to have a conversation about how the state wants to take over our airport. Uh, and, and I think that it is the, the same paternalistic nature of, of leadership and, and the view of the city of Jackson from the state. And we have to be able to move away from that to make certain that we protect people. When we don't have a sustainable water infrastructure, when we don't have an equitable distribution of our water system, there are children left in the balance. There are elderly left in the balance. In a COVID environment, we are making things far less safe for us all. Uh, and we should be able to be able we should be able to maintain these conversations uh, without uh, the the normal uh, politics to ensue. And I mean, Mayor, how frustrating is that for you? How frustrating is that for for your fellow Jacksonians uh, who voted for for President Biden? Uh, I recognize that Mississippi uh, voted for President Trump, but for the people that voted for President Biden uh, because they wanted the help, because they wanted a government that would uh, be responsive to so many of these issues that you're raising. How frustrating is it for them that, that they are having to kind of grapple with uh, the political realities that you just laid out? Well, in a word, extremely. Uh, not only has uh, Jackson, by and large, been supportive of the Biden administration, uh, this administration, my, my office, has been heavily engaged in the infrastructure discussion. Uh, I spoke with uh, former Mayor Mitch Landrew as, as recently as today, uh, talking about these issues and talking about uh, how the White House wants us to know that they are concerned about what we receive, uh, making sure we're aware of competitive dollars that are available. Uh, you know, when the infrastructure bill was signed, uh, I was unable to attend because uh, we had EPA Administrator Regan here in town looking at these issues, uh, making sure that he demonstrated not only a desire to have a firsthand uh, account of what was taking place, but also to demonstrate that they wanted uh, a partnership uh, wanted us to know that they wanted to be a resource to help deal with these issues. Uh, and so they are, you know, they are demonstrating that they, they want to put skin in the game. They are demonstrating that they want to be that resource, but they also understand that the state has a role to play. And so I think that it is important that we bring these issues to bear right now in this moment, as everyone is still uh, trying to iron out the details of what allocation looks like and make certain that, that the world focuses on whether a state like Mississippi, a state which unfortunately uh, has been coined for its negative history, is now willing to turn the page 
and demonstrate equity and love for all of its residents, especially a city which is three times larger than the next largest city, uh, a city which is uh, not only the capital of the state of Mississippi, but the capital of healthcare in, in the central Mississippi area. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make certain that we get a commensurate representation of, of dollars to deal with our issues here in town. Mayor Shukwe Lumumba, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy your holiday. Do the same. Thank you. Well, still ahead, outbursts, confrontations, and even violence on airplanes is putting flight attendants and passengers at risk in flight like never before. My colleague at the 19th joins me to discuss why violent incidents are on the rise. skies are becoming a lot more turbulent with onboard violent incidents on the rise and that's even before the high volume high stress holiday travel season. Shabele Carazana, my colleague at the 19th, has a look at just how dangerous it's become to be a flight attendant. This year alone there's been a more than five-fold increase in the number of violent incidents on planes. The Federal Aviation Administration initiated 183 investigations in 2020, about average, but as of mid-November of this year, the FAA initiated nearly a thousand. It's an unprecedented spike. Going all the way back to 1996, there hasn't been a single year with even half as many FAA investigations as there were in 2021. And it's putting flight crews in harm's way. Here's a look at just some incidents this year from NBC's Tom Costello. In Fort Lauderdale, an all-out fist fight after passengers deplaned, refusing to wear masks. In D.C., a passenger removed after allegedly arguing with flight attendants over the mask rule. In Denver, an emergency landing after a man tried to open an emergency exit. Police in Denver arrested this man after the airline says he punched a flight attendant in the face twice when she accidentally bumped into him and then apologized. She had blood splattered on the outside of her mask. The FAA says there have been nearly 5,000 reports of unruly passengers so far this year, a record. Nearly three quarters related to the mask order. And that's just a small taste of what flight crews across the country have had to endure. According to a survey from the Flight Attendants Union, more than 85% of flight attendants dealt with unruly passengers in the first half of 2021. Nearly 60% experienced at least five incidents, and one in six flight attendants has been part of a physical attack. It's absolutely unacceptable. Breaking up fights and dealing with verbal or physical abuse should not be part of the flight crew job description. And behind the numbers are stories of real human beings. For example, my colleague Shabelli writes about Cher Taylor, a black flight attendant who experienced one of these outbursts. Taylor was forced to step into the middle of a fight between two men, intercepting threats and racial slurs spouted by a white passenger involved in the confrontation. It triggered something in my soul that will never, ever leave, she said. She dreamt of the fight that night, but this time she was being forced to watch. She called her therapist. When she got home, she didn't go outside for five days. Now, with the holiday season upon us and travel on the rise, what kinds of brawls and tantrums and just downright rudeness could airline employees be subjected to in the coming weeks? And more importantly, what in the world has happened to us as a society? Joining me now, the author of that article and economy reporter for the 19th, Chibelli Carazana, and president of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA, Sarah Nelson. Chibelli, Sarah, thank you both so much for being here. You know this is an issue near and dear to me. My mom was a flight attendant for more than 30 years. My best friend is a flight attendant. This is really important for us to talk about to try to maybe keep some of these people off the naughty list. Uh, Chibelli, we know about three quarters of these incidents are mask related. What are some of the other factors that are contributing to this spike and why? Well, Aaron, first of all, it's great to join you, seeing you here in the anchor seat. It's great to see you again and, um, and Sarah to speak with you again. Look, a lot of these incidents are mask related. We know the mask mandate has played a large part in this, partially because we did not have a federal mask mandate until this year. There's a lot of confusion around that topic, but that is not the only piece and we need to think about this job and how it has worked in the past. Sexual harassment is huge. 
um, for flight attendants, a big issue they have to deal with. There's a lot of, like you mentioned, the racial slurs, homophobic comments. That is all part of what these attendants are, are contending with on a daily basis. And so I think it's sort of a layered uh, problem taking into, into account the sort of the history of sexual harassment in this, in this profession in particular, and also this stress and anxiety that has built and built and built over the past two years. Yeah, I read in your uh, eye-popping article that alcohol is also a factor in, in this as well, contributing to uh, people's misbehavior uh, once they get on these flights. Uh, Sarah, you spoke to Shabelli for her article. How is this affecting your flight attendants and how they do their jobs every single day? Well, first of all, I really want to thank Shabelli for her very, very careful reporting, uh, honest reporting. and. I don't think that there is another reporter that Sherry Taylor would have been willing to speak to. I know that that was a big deal for her to tell her story, and that was very difficult. And that's what's going on out there, is it's not just the issues that are making the evening news, but the way that people are being chipped away at and the way that they are being shaken to their core by these experiences. Uh, sexual harassment, racism, uh, the homophobic slurs that are hurtled at people. This is not about any, it, it's not about sex. It's not about racism, it's about power. And yeah. it's about people feeling that they are out of control at this time and being told that we're at odds with each other and being told that there is an attack on their personal liberties so that they can we can keep people apart. All of those issues are tactics of the boss to keep us apart. And so this has been really pushed and 61% of the incidents I also include uh, sexual, uh, racial, or homophobic slurs. And so <laughs> this is really about a society that is trying to regain some control when they have felt so out of control and not given uh, correct information about this pandemic, being kept in a state of uncertainty all this time. You can't do that to people. You have to, have to operate off the same set of facts. Flight attendants are there for the safety, health, and security of everyone on board. We are there to be leaders. When that leadership is undermined, all of us are less safe. So we have to get this under control because the only way that air travel happens is with the spirit that we're all in this together and everyone following the rules. So we've got to get this under control for the safety of everyone, for the ability to have the freedom of flight, and for the basic uh, common decency that we need to show each other to have a civil society. Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah, such a good reminder. Flight attendants are there to provide safety, not to be made to feel less unsafe. And, and, and yes, flying, the, the ability to fly and, and travel freely across this country is absolutely a privilege. So, Shabelli, we know this is a problem. How are airlines trying to address this issue? Well, we know that airlines are trying to crack down. There's messages when you get on a plane. I flew recently, I heard the message, you know, the pilot saying, flight attendants are my representatives in the cabin. You need to respect them and what they say. Uh, we have seen um, some airports put uh, messages on to go alcohol, reminding folks you cannot take this with you on a plane. The FAA has tried to crack down on this as well, sort of trying to tear away at pieces of this. And of course, the FAA is uh, pursuing some uh, 37 of these cases have been referred to the FBI of the most mm. serious cases on planes uh, to try to see if there is some enforcement that can come about quickly to send a message to folks, particularly as this holiday season is approaching, that this is not okay and this is going to be enforced quite strictly on planes. Well, Sarah, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg came out in support of a no-fly list for violent and unruly passengers. Critics say that that's too harsh of a punishment and could splinter families. Do you support that idea? And if so, how do you envision a fair no-fly list? Well, look, I think that there has to be very clear consequences. And if someone is acting out on a plane violently against other people or against the crew and putting everyone in danger, uh, they should lo lose their privileges to fly. Um, now, each case needs to have a due process, and we want to make sure that people's civil li liberties are maintained in this process. But if there is a fulsome investigation by the FAA and they have determined that someone is worthy of a fine, for example, or if DOJ concludes its prosecution and someone is convicted of a crime, they should be put on a no-fly list. We can work through the issues and, and uh, the due process that needs to be in place there, but the consequences have to be communicated to people because that does serve as a deterrent. And we will see these incidents go down when people understand that there are real consequences for acting this way on a plane. 
Well, Sarah, more than 93% of TSA employees have gotten vaccinated. And United Airlines CEO Scott Kirby was on the Today Show this week. He said that out of 70,000 employees, United only terminated about 200 because of vaccine mandate noncompliance. Was the controversy over these mandates overblown? Absolutely. Uh, this, first of all, uh, let's, let's be clear. We were very lucky in the United States to have access to the vaccines almost before the rest of the world. We know that we were nine months ahead of Canada and Canada was clamoring for that vaccine. And once they got it, now 90% of the country is vaccinated. We have had conflicting information in this, in this country. It has been politicized and people have been given false information about the vaccine and that has been what's been in the way. When employers are putting the vaccine mandate in place, it is making people have to think about it. It's making people have to get good information because they have to think about whether or not they would give up their job in order to avoid getting the vaccine. For flight attendants, our workplace is the world. So we're not just subject to the vaccine mandates here in the United States, we're subject to the vaccine mandates in every other country as well. So we have to be clear with people about the fact that this is a worldwide pandemic the only way that we're going to end it is if we end it together. And if the virus is allowed to exist anywhere, we all continue to be in jeopardy. So these vaccine mandates are great. Now, I want to be really clear, though, too. The union has a role here. We have to enforce the terms of the contract. We have to make sure that it's fair. We have to make sure that people have proper notification and support in order to get the vaccine um, if these are work mandates. And we also have to make sure that there is a fair uh, process for accommodations because there are some people who have medical concerns and, and uh, serious uh, religious uh, concerns that, that should have an accommodation process that is fair and transparent, equal for everyone. Well, Chibelli Carazana and Sarah Nelson, thank you both so much. Enjoy your holiday. Thank you so much. Thanks, Erin. For millions of Americans, this Thanksgiving is the first they feel they can all get together safely to eat, celebrate, maybe watch some football, cap it all off with a nap. But others feel called to volunteer as a way to give thanks this holiday season. Sorting and packing our favorite holiday comfort foods, delivering meals and the Thanksgiving spirit to the elderly, or cooking and serving dinner at a community kitchen. But those efforts could look much different this year, depending on where you live. Economic hardship because of the pandemic has made the need for a hot meal even greater. Analysis from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities shows that black and Latino adults were more than twice as likely as white adults to report that their household did not get enough to eat. Adults who identify as American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, or multiracial were more than three times as likely to white, than white adults to report that their household did not get enough to eat. In every community, there are groups ready to serve. One from my hometown is Hosea Helps. The Atlanta-based organization was started by Hosea Williams, a lieutenant of civil rights icon Martin Luther King Jr., and himself a hero of the movement. Hosea Helps has been working to stabilize families who were at risk of poverty for five decades. I grew up watching their good works, and as a reporter, I have covered this annual event. But this year is not like years gone by amid a rising pandemic and rising inflation impacting everyday things that we buy at the store. The CEO, Elizabeth Omalami, joins us now to discuss. Thank you so much for being here. This, uh, this organization serves families year round, but Thanksgiving is really your signature event. Uh, talk to me about the unique challenges that the organization has dealt with during the pandemic and what you're hearing from the people that you serve. Thank you, Erin, so much for having uh, Hosea Helps. I think what makes this year different than any other year is that it is the parents of the children that we serve that have lost jobs. Those working in wait as waitresses, those working in hospitality industry, in hotels, in rent-a-car uh, companies, those working in um, those industries that just did not do well during COVID. And so not only were they struggling, say in February of 2020, but after uh, even a year later, they have not been able to replace those jobs. We distributed $4,800,000 in rental assistance wow. in just one year between February 2020 and, and just a, a couple of months ago. So we've seen our a request for emergency food, rent assistance, mortgage assistance, as well as things as simple as 
laptops for students uh, almost triple in emergency requests, while on the other hand, donations have gone down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you have been evolving to respond to the needs going so far beyond uh, the original mission of the organization to, to really be there for, for this community. Uh, for people looking to volunteer or donate, I mean, I've seen your Twitter feed. I know that, that you are calling for folks to step up. What are you most in need of at this time? At this time, toys. Because of the mm. supply chain and because of the inability of many ch people to even get toys for their own children. Of course, the children that we serve, one in four families in Atlanta, is struggling with just buying food. And access to food is very political now. It's 15% it's higher, even turkeys, for example, $38 mm. for one turkey. So we're looking, we need toys, we need turkeys, we need uh, everything you would need for your Thanksgiving feast, but we also need gift cards for those teenagers who never really get anything during the holidays because most of the toys are for younger children. So we're giving them gift cards so they can go out and get what they need. You're looking at and the two Atlantas. There's a rich, wealthy Atlanta, but the price for the average home in Atlanta is now $325,000. So there's no affordable housing. We hope mm -hmm. that whoever becomes the mayor addresses that. But this is my 30th year running the organization. And unfortunately, I have never seen a year like this when it mm -hmm. comes to, you know, even things like domestic violence during COVID. Women suffering yeah. from domestic yeah. violence were strapped during COVID. They couldn't get help. Defects wouldn't come to the home. They couldn't get to telephones. They're living in their cars. We have 25 families right now living in hotels. Hosea helps, needs help. Yeah. Uh, and and, and um, so many challenges, uh, the, you know, the city too busy to hate, though, hopefully will be a city that is not too busy to help. Uh, you, you mentioned this is your 30th year uh, with Hosea mm -hmm. Helps, but this is also just a big year for the entire organization. You all celebrated 50 years of feeding the hungry. And, and I remember when your father, Jose Williams, passed away in 2000. How do you think that he would see the mission today? And how do you think he'd see the moment of advocacy and civil rights that we are living in now? I think that it would be bittersweet because I think that he would have expected that, you know, uh, politically we would have advanced much further the attack on voting rights, uh, which he led the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge that led to the Voting Rights Act. He would not believe that there isn't such an attack against people just voting. And I think that he would be very proud of our city but at the same time, with so much wealth, uh, their gap between the haves, as he called it, and the have-nots is widening. And technology is a big issue in that creating that gap because we have children that not only did not do well uh, at school uh, on their laptops, but just stopped going to school altogether because they had no access to the internet. So all of the, these problems add together, make for a terrible conundrum. But Hosea Helps is able to step in. We serve 51,000 people a year now. And that number has increased over the years. We just opened a brand new headquarters off of Cleveland Avenue here in Atlanta, Georgia. And Atlanta is a marker for what's happening in cities all across the country yeah. in that the issue of poverty and equity and racial justice walk hand in hand, but mm -hmm. it's not a part of the conversation. Who's talking about those issues? Yeah, yeah. Who are? Well, Eli well Elizabeth Omolami, I'm so sorry that we are out of time. You are your father's living legacy. Thank you so much for joining us and happy holiday season to you. That does it for me tonight. I'm so grateful for all of you. Mehdi will be back next week, but for now, Happy Thanksgiving from all of us at the Mehdi Hassan Show. Good night.
Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.